So we had figures out, uh, the latest figures for people on out-of-work benefits has risen from 5.2 to 5.4 million people. It's about one in eight of the working age population. Um, Mel Stride, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, had promised that they were going to, uh, to, to make some changes to the assessments, to encourage people back into work. Uh, but he seems to say that it's all too difficult and takes too long and he's kicked it into the long grass post the election. I mean, what's going on? Good morning, Richard. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, no, it's it's an absolutely, um, it, I mean, it's, it's scandalous, really, that we're in this situation um, where a population larger than the Birmingham metropolitan area um, is sort of out of work for the taxpayer paying for them. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any real urgency to do anything about this. They have this consultation on reforming work capability assessments. It's not due to actually putting reforms into place until 2025. Um, I suppose one possible motivation would be simply that they believe that from an election year coming up, attempting to tackle benefits would be too tricky. Um, but you know, it could well be the case that this is the sort of thing they actually need to be thinking about doing, and that there is actually a fairly significant amount of support from the population for reforming these benefits and making sure that people are actually working for a living. I mean, that's because one in eight of the working age population, and this number is going up dramatically. Now, look, we all want a, a high quality, fair, efficient system that helps the disabled, the sick, the vulnerable, those genuinely seeking, uh, genuinely out of work, seeking work. That's what a proper uh, benefit system is designed to do. And of course, there'll be mistakes and errors. We all get that. But you've got a system here where where essentially for too many people, they're realising that actually tax-free benefits that have just been inflated by uh, the rate of inflation, that essentially for too many people on low incomes who are being taxed, it no longer, it no longer pays to go to work. I think it certainly doesn't help. As, as you say, um, they made the decision to upgrade benefits in line with inflation, and our Rishi Singh today has been saying um, perhaps that might not be what they do with the next sort of um, upgrading. But back in April, when the decision was made, they went up by 10% at the point when wages were growing by something like 7% in the private sector. So you end up with, um, for a fairly substantial proportion at the very bottom of the distribution, that calculation about, you know, attempting to work and attempting to do um, in benefits was tilted slightly. Um, at the same time as well, since the pandemic, we've had a real plummet in the number of face-to-face -face capability assessments. Um, and the net result does seem to be, uh, combined also with the absolute dysfunction of the NHS, that a large number of people are sort of claim benefits who we would prefer to have in the workforce and that this is not going to be a sustainable situation in the long run. Because I think the ONS is forecasting over the next four or five years an increase in the number of people on disability and sickness benefits of an additional million people. Now, I, I mean, what, what that says about the health of the nation and the, the outcomes of the NHS, I mean, that's essentially saying that our health is going to get worse and that our, our healthcare system is is actually allowing that to happen. I mean, it's it's a pretty gloomy prospect. I know, um, and it, you know, it's it's kind of difficult to look around the room to find some particularly optimistic prospects when you look at the British economy. In some ways, you have the, um, the sort of the permanent benefits crisis, which is being exacerbated by the permanent NHS crisis, and then of course you have the um, complete inability of the government to control the borders at the moment. And, and, I mean, just, just finally, Mel, the thing about the universal credit system, which was introduced by Sir Ian Duncan Smith, is that initially it was actually, I think many people from, from all parties were saying actually that it was working well and it was encouraging people to back into work. But since COVID, that seems to have gone, you know, completely in reverse. You've got a, a million and a half more people on out-of-work benefits post-COVID than pre-COVID. I just don't understand why it takes at least a year in order to bring back some assessments and, condi and condition checks that were previously used. Yeah, I believe that looking at tightening some of the, the checks um, and basically reforming the way they're done, but it is it is essentially a problem of um, delay here because this problem was visible last year. The rise was beginning and people were talking about it. And now we're sort of, what, September this year, and we're now saying, well, maybe we'll get to have a consultation or we'll make a change in 2025. You have an election next year. And it just sort of feels like the, the time to do something about this was earlier on. It was allowed to drift, as has been the case with far too many things over the last uh, year and a half, really. Um, and we sort of find ourselves saying, well, actually, perhaps it's too hard to do anything immediately. And we'll just leave for the late party.
I just, but that's just not leadership. And what we're seeing far too often, whether it's on this, that, that essentially the Tories are just kicking the can down the road. I'm going to be talking later in the show about uh, trans guidance for teachers and heads in schools. And again, it looks like the Tories are just kicking the can down the road. It's just, I mean, it's just a complete failure of leadership.